tell us a little bit about the history and journey of Mahindra and Mohammad and how did it become Mahindra today and what do you all stand for? So it was taken for granted everything that was articulated in this ad. But when I was looking for defining a core purpose for the group back in the 90s, and I was doing that exercise with Prochi, and we were going around looking for some core purpose for the group. And then we just chanced upon this ad in the archives. And I said, we don't have to look uh, for any core purpose. We just go back to the future, so to speak. And when we come to the topic of today, when you talk about diversity and inclusion, how could we not be a diverse and inclusive organization when this was the first principles that were enunciated by the founders? And it makes, you know, it. it gives me goosebumps when I read it, that this was 1945. And these three individuals, um, because it was my granduncle, my grandfather, and Ghulam Mohammed, who sat down and uh, penned this. And it, as you said, it's not an ad about products or services. The first thing that Mahindra and Mohammed spoke about were their principles. And so if you look at one of them, the fifth principle that is articulated there, is about aptitude and merit being the only determinant of your success in the organization, not color, caste, or creed. How more, you know, can you get more clear than that when you want to define what the company stands for? Of course, when we see it from the outside, we can see the number of women on the board going up. Uh, we can also see much younger people on the board. Um, and those are, to your point, just externally visible markers, right? But how have you gone about on this journey, which is for you driven by kind of what your grandfather and granduncle started? It came out of a recognition that we were actually laggards and we didn't have enough uh, diversity on the board. So we went about it very intentionally of looking for women who we felt would add to the whole texture of the board. There was always somebody you could get if you broadened your horizon into not looking just for a CV which said, you know, this was the corporate history of that uh, woman. Uh, you have to recognize that women in other fields bring tremendous, op uh, tremendous value too. And I think that's something we still have to do. I would still like to get women in, Vikram, you should think about this, about women who are not necessarily from the corporate sphere. Yeah, yeah. or might be from the NGO, uh, from the social sector, or from the arts, or from some kind of um, profession which involves empathy, which involves uh, inclusion, which involves leadership. Because leadership you can find in women in a multitude of fields. So, as you think about organizations you've been in and more importantly boards you've been in right describe how that journey has played out kind of for, for both of you right diversity and then how that actually contributes to the to the dynamic in the boardroom to the narrative in the boardroom yes that's a very uh, uh, actually interesting question because the I'd say from my own personal experience the politically correct answer would be that a company that has a very strong agenda towards diversity is in fact truly diverse. That does not necessarily happen. What is a very major contributor to, to true diversity is the culture. And at the board level, uh, it all actually rests on the chairman and maybe the lead director, lead independent director or the on how they contribute to a, a culture of diversity within the boardroom. Do they en enable, do they allow for diverse thoughts to, to rise to the surface? Do they allow for diverse voices to be heard? Or is the chairman going to dominate the discussion? Or is it going to be the CEO who's going to take up 60% of the conversation during a board discussion? And the important thing is that as the company, this company or other companies start to tackle the complexity of our new world. And this is a truly new world, a world where, you know, the unexpected is the expected. <laughs> you really do need uh, the board 
uh, as a sort of the body that so that oversees strategy, that oversees management, and in some sense, not management, sorry, the management structure and the executive decision making, the quality of executive decision making. You really do need a board that compels the management to ask, to look at issues from every perspective. And that is only possible if the board asks challenging questions. And that is only possible if the chairman allows for that culture to develop, to evolve.